Hello fellow computer enthusiasts, my name is Christian, hope you're doing well today. Welcome to a new episode of ILTP WC and in this episode we will create a complex application like a Game Boy emulator in this episode and the full source code will be provided by ChatGPT, an artificial intelligence that can really really do amazing things with source code and languages of all kind. So let's follow me into my home lab and let's see if the AI can create complex software such as in Game Boy Emulator. The Game Boy, released in the year 1989, took the world by storm with its portable design and captivating games. It received mixed reviews but quickly became a cultural icon, selling an estimated 118 million units worldwide with a lifespan of nearly 14 years production. Production continues until 2003. At its core, it features a custom 8-bit CPU from Sharp, 48 kilobyte of address space and a picture processing unit or PPU responsible for rendering graphics. In order to write an emulator for such a console, we need to dig a bit deeper into the architecture of the system and see how the CPU, memory, PPU, sound and input works in detail and together. The Game Boy CPU is an 8-bit processor made by Sharp and is a hybrid of the very successful Zilog Z80 and the successful Intel 8080 processor running at 4.19 MHz. This might sound low by today's standard, but it was actually quite powerful for a handheld console at the time. The CPU is what enables the Game Boy to once game like Tetris, Super Mario Land and Pokemon, which became huge system seller on the platform. The CPU is also what allows the Game Boy to have a long battery life. Since it doesn't require as much power as a more advanced processor, the CPU has 8KB of internal RAM, which is used for game logic and data storage. Games are loaded from cartridges, which plugs into the top of the Game Boy, and the CPU uses a custom bus protocol to communicate with them. The Game Boy has 8 and 16-bit registers, and the CPU executes instruction fetch from the memory, with each instruction corresponding to an opcode. The Game Boy CPU has a total of 265 8-bit opcodes and additional 59 16-bit opcodes, which are sometimes referred to as the Game Boy Color CPU instruction set. The Game Boy used a combination of volatile and non-volatile memory to store game data, save files and system information. Firstly, let's talk about volatile memory. The Game Boy has 8KB of internal RAM, which is used to temporarily store game data and variables while the game is running. This memory is volatile, meaning it is lost when the console is turned off or when the battery is running out. To save your progress in a game, you need to use non-volatile memory in the form of a battery-packed SRAM cartridge. This cartridge contains a small battery and additional RAM, allowing you to save your game progress even when the console is turned off. The Game Boy also has a separate area of memory called VRAM, which is used to store graphics data for the screen. VRAM is also volatile, but it can be written to and read from much faster than regular RAM, making it ideal for storing graphics data. Finally, there is a memory mapped I.O. registers, which control various system settings and peripherals, like the sound and the link cable. These registers are located at a specific memory address and can be accessed directly by the CPU. Game Boy memory consists of a 64 kilobyte address space divided into areas like ROM, Video RAM or VRAM, Work RAM and object attribute memory. The memory unit or MMU handles mapping between the CPU and the various memory regions. The Game Boy originally launched with a cartridge that had a maximum capacity of 265 kilobits, which limited the amount of data that could be stored on a game cartridge. However, as the console became more popular, third-party manufacturers begin producing larger capacity cartridges that contain additional memory. One type of cartridge module that became very popular was the Memory Bank Controller or MBC, which allowed cartridges to have an additional RAM that could be used for safe games or for other purposes. The MBC module varied in size and capabilities, with some offering as little as 32 kilobytes of additional RAM, while others offered up to 128 kilobytes. The MBC1 module, for example, was a popular module that offered up to two megabytes of ROM and 32 kilobytes of RAM, which could be used for saving game data. 
The MBC2 module, on the other hand, offered only 512 kilobyte of ROM and a built-in 512-bit RAM for saving games. The MBC5 module was one of the later MBC types used in Game Boy cartridges. It offered up to 8 MB of ROM and 128 KB of RAM, making it one of the most powerful MBC options. It also supports bank switching, making it a versatile and flexible option for game developers. Other type of cartridge modules offered more specialized features, such as a real-time clock module, which contained a clock that keep track of real-time even when the console was turned off. Some MBC modules also has additional hardware features, like the ability to switch between multiple banks of memory or to control other peripherals, such as a rumble pack. The Game Boy's graphic processing is handled by its CPU and a dedicated graphics controller called the Picture Processing Unit or PPU. The PPU is responsible for generating the output of the Game Boy, which includes the 160 by 144 pixel screen with four shades of grey. The PPU also provides hardware support for scrolling, which allowed developers to create scrolling backgrounds and other visual effects. The PPU works in conjunction with the CPU to draw images on the Game Boy screen. The CPU is responsible for updating the graphics data in real time, while the PPU handles the task of displaying the graphics data on the screen. The PPU uses a technique called tile-based graphics to draw images on the screen, where graphics data is stored in small tiles that can be combined to larger images. The Game Boy graphics memory is divided into two sections, the background map data and the tile data. The background map data specifies the layout of the screen, while the tile data specifies the actual graphics data for each tile. The PPU also provides hardware support for displaying sprites, which are small images that can be moved around the screen independently of the background. The Game Boy can display up to 40 sprites on a screen at once, with each sprite limited to a maximum of 8 by 16 pixels, and you can only draw 10 sprites on a line. Overall, while the graphics capabilities were relative simply compared to more advanced consoles, the PPU allowed for a wide range of creative and visual interesting games to be developed for the platform. The PPU was an important component of the Game Boy hardware, helping to make it one of the most popular and enduring handheld consoles of all time. So, with all that background information about the Game Boy's architecture, let's ask ChatGPT if he can create such an emulator for this system. From my previous experiments from building a Doom engine with ChatGPT4, I was aware that GPT is not able to provide the full source code at once due to the high complexity of the software and the artificial restrictions in length that an answer can have. Therefore, I decided to start with a brainstorming how to implement the emulator and work then step by step along the provided guideline. We started by discussing the central elements of the emulator, the CPU, memory and the picture processing unit. For the CPU, we considered the custom 8-bit processor used on the Game Boy, which is a hybrid as mentioned of the Zilog Z80 and the Intel 8080 processor. We explored the various registers and instructions the CPU handles, as well as how it fetches and decodes opcodes. Next, we delved into the memory system, examining the 64 kilobyte address space, which is divided into different regions, as mentioned like ROM, VRAM, WorkRAM, OAM and so on. We discussed the role of the memory management unit in mapping these regions to the CPU. And finally, we touched upon the PPU responsible for rendering the Game Boy graphics. We looked at how the picture processing unit processes backgrounds, windows and sprites and how it combines these elements to create the final image displayed on the Game Boy screen. Throughout our brainstorming session, we considered various challenges and potential solutions to implement these components effectively. This groundwork will lay the foundation for building an emulator that can bring the magic of the Game Boy to life once again. We began by implementing the registers class, which represents the CPU's internal registers, including 8-bit registers like A, F, B, C, D, E, H and L, as well as a 16-bit register such as SP for the stack pointer and PC for the program counter. We implemented methods to get, set and manipulate these registers, such as setting and clearing flags in the F register. Afterwards, we moved on to the memory class. 
we first discuss the Game Boy memory map, which consists as mentioned of several regions. We implemented a simple memory array to store the contents of those regions and created methods to read and write bytes and words to and from memory. We also discussed the role of the memory management unit, MMU, in handling the mapping between the CPU and the different memory regions. Throughout the implementation process, we faced various challenges and made design decisions to ensure the smooth functioning of both the registers and memory components. With these foundational elements in place, we are well prepared to build upon them as we continue to build the Game Boy emulator. And I started with the memory and CPU registers because I already knew that GPT isn't consistent while in classes and interfaces that fit together. And that you have to come up with a clean interface design and an implementation approach in order to get working code, especially when it comes to big classes and complex systems like the emulator. We continued by creating the CPU class and defining its main components, including the registers and memory objects we already created. We then implemented the CPU's fetch, decode and execute cycle, which is the heart of the CPU's operation. This cycle involves fetching an opcode from our memory table, decoding it to identify the corresponding instruction and executing the instruction. To handle the large amount of opcodes and their corresponding instructions, we built an opcode map that maps opcodes to their respective instruction method and operand counts. This enables us to efficiently decode and execute instructions with a simple lookup. Next, we implemented numerous instruction methods to handle various tasks, such as loading, storing, arithmetic operations, logic operations, jumps and calls. So everything that the Game Boy assembly language can offer to us. This also involved a combination of register manipulations, memory access and flag management. We also faced several challenges during this implementation process, such as handling the correct number of operands for each instruction, correctly setting and clearing flags and addressing various compatibility issues. Despite these challenges, we successfully implemented a significant portion of the CPU functionality. With the CPU implementation close to complete, we have laid the groundwork for the emulator's main processing unit. On the last mile to see something on the screen, we delved into the fascinating world of the Game Boy's picture processing unit, an essential component responsible for rendering graphics on the screen. The PPU is a complex piece of hardware and understanding its inner working is crucial for emulating the Game Boy's visuals accurately. We started by implementing the PPU class and defining its main components, such as the registers and the memory objects. We then created methods to read and write the PPU registers, which control various aspects of the rendering process, such as the LCD control, screen position and background tile map. Next, we focused on the PPU's rendering pipeline, which consists of multiple stages. We implemented methods for rendering the background, the window and the sprite layers, which are all combined to produce a final frame displayed on the screen. To achieve this, we had to carefully manage the PPU's internal states and coordinate the rendering process on a per line basis, just as the real Game Boy does it. This involved calculating tiles and pixel positions, fetching tile data from memory and blending the different layers in the correct order together. Finally, we integrated the PPU with our existing CPU and memory implementation, allowing us to output the rendered frame and see the emulator in action. This marked a significant milestone in our journey towards building a complete and accurate Game Boy emulator. While we have made significant progress on the CPU, memory and PPU, there are still a few key aspects left to tackle and to ensure a fully functional and accurate emulation experience. First, we need to implement the Game Boy's audio system, the audio processing unit or APU. The APU features four sound channels, each responsible for generating different types of audio, such as square wave, a programmable wavetable and noise. To emulate the APU, we will need to create methods for processing audio data, generating waveforms and controlling the various sound parameters. Next, we have to handle user input by emulating the Game Boy's buttons and directional pad controls. This will involve capturing input events from a suitable input device, such as a Game Boy or Game Controller, and mapping them to the corresponding Game Boy buttons. Additionally, we must ensure that the emulator responds to input in a timely manner, accurately reflecting the original hardware's behavior. 
Another important aspect is the emulation of a card with specific hardware, such as memory banks, real-time clocks and other custom chips found in the Game Boy games. Implementing these features will require a deep understanding of the various cartridge types that, to be honest, I currently don't have and their unique functionalities. Lastly, we'll need to work on performance optimization and accuracy improvements to ensure a smooth gameplay experience. This might involve implementing more efficient algorithms, refining our existing code and swirly testing the emulator against a wide range of Game Boy games to identify and fix any inaccuracies and bugs. And to be honest, the whole opcode implementation is not finished yet. When I try to load the Game Boy game Tetris, then we can come to the main menu, but we can't play, because then we run into opcodes that are currently not implemented in a wide fashion, so I have to fix this first. In today's episode, we have made a significant progress on a Game Boy emulator, but there is still work to be done. I'm excited to continue this journey and promise to see it through the completion. To make this process more collaborative, I made the source code available on GitHub and I invite you to contribute by creating pull requests to help me finish the emulator. Together we can create an accurate and enjoyable emulation experience for everyone. If you are interested in contributing or just following along with my progress, check out the GitHub repository in the video description. Your input and expertise are invaluable to this project and I am looking forward to seeing what we can accomplish as a community together. As always, if you enjoyed the video and found it helpful, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Your support means a lot to me and helps me create more engaging content for you. I have got some exciting plans for the future videos, including a series on creating your own Game Boy game and building an 8-bit computer from scratch in hardware. Stay tuned for more in-depth explanation of these fascinating topics as I continue to delve into the world of retro gaming and computer hardware. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe and share with your friends. I'll see you in the next episode of ILTP WC. Thanks for watching this episode of ILTP WC. I hope you enjoyed and really liked the content. If so, please keep the thumbs up, like the video and please subscribe to my channel. Hope to see you in future. Thanks a lot and bye bye.